Our sermon will be taken from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 37 through 50. This is the word of God. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, I would not heal them. Isaiah said, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. For one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Thus says the Lord. Friends, this is a tough text for a lot of us, perhaps, especially because this is a text that um, asks and answers two particular questions that is very commonly asked um, in anyone. Commonly asked in our culture, commonly asked in your privacy, commonly asked by any person who's ever thought about the meaning of life or anything at all. That is two fundamental questions. First, there's a God. And this God, as classically understood, is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good, how does the sovereignty of God relate with human responsibility? That's a fundamental question that any one of us have asked. Uh, movies have broached on that sort of question. We've all asked it in our own heads. We've all had conversations about it. So this passage discusses that fundamental question. How does God's sovereignty relate with our human responsibility? If God is in complete control over all things, what do we do and what do we say about human failure, human depravity, and human unbelief, especially to the Savior of the world in Christ Jesus? Second question that fundamentally is being asked in us and around us everywhere is, is there an afterlife? Is there a heaven and a hell? Is there a final judgment? Is there eternity? Why, if there is no eternity, why do we feel that we are meant to live forever? Why do we feel that death is such a great tragedy? And if there is an afterlife, how do we get there? Is there such a thing as a final judgment? Is there such a thing as eternity with God? So these are the two fundamental questions that this text in the Gospel of John is seeking to answer. And this text in the Gospel of John, just to remind us as we're going through our series in this Gospel, is actually the last passage in Jesus' public ministry. Jesus' public ministry started in chapter 2 with a sign of the miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding. And it culminated in the resurrection of Lazarus that we saw in chapter 11. And in chapter 12, after Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, people were expecting him to become a kind of Jewish Messiah that would free them from Roman rule. Jesus and John finally intercedes um, uh, and, and narrates for us and, and tells us the meaning of everything that has happened in the last 10 chapters, chapter 2, chapter 12. And tells us what is the meaning of Jesus' public ministry. Why does that despite his public ministry, so many people, especially his own people, the Jews, still did not believe in him. So in verses 37 to 43, we have the narrator, John, telling us what is the meaning of Jesus' public ministry. He's interceding suddenly. He intervenes. He comes before us and says, all right, we've seen Jesus' public ministry, and yet so many people disbelieve him. Why is that? So John, the narrator, suddenly comes in and explains to us from two passages in Isaiah. And in 44 to 50, we see Jesus' last public monologue before the final discourse where Jesus washes the disciples' feet in the upper room in privacy. Jesus will talk to them in in chapters 14 to 17 and prays for them. And then finally, in chapters 18 onwards, we have the cross and the the resurrection of Jesus. So this is the last passage that talks about the public ministry of Christ. And with that being said, there are going to be three points that we're going to cover today. The first point is about God's perfect plan. The second point is about Christian love. And the third point is about God's just judgment and the offer of eternal life. So God's perfect plan, Christian love, and God's final judgments, his just judgments, and the offer of eternal life. So first, 
God's perfect plan. Notice the immediate context of this. The immediate context of this, again, is the, the, the climaxing of Jesus' public ministry. It's finishing up. It's wrapping up. And what we've seen in 10 chapters, from chapter 2 to chapter 12, is a consistency of unbelief. So John, in verse 37, says this. Though he had done so many signs before them, in other words, so, though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they, his own people, the Israelites, many, still did not believe in him. And not only that, the immediate context of that, um, as last week we saw in the last sermon, we saw that Greeks were coming to see Jesus. Instead of the Jews coming to see Jesus, Greeks, Gentiles, those who were thought to be not uh, clean people, those who were thought to be not God's chosen people, were coming to see Jesus. And Andrew and Philip asked Jesus, should we accept them? And Jesus says, uh, if a wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, Jesus is already saying again that the hour has come that he will die and the Greeks will now enter into the covenant life of God and they will also have received eternal life. So in verse 37, John, suddenly the narrator, John, asks this question because the, the question that is looming before them right now is this. If Jesus really is the Jewish Messiah, if Jesus really is the expected prophet, the one who, would to, who was to come, the one prophesied all the way throughout the Old Testament that would save his people from tyranny, the one that would save his people from their sins, why then does he seem to be such a failure? Why do so many people still disbelieve in him? Though they have done so many signs, he's done so many signs in front of them, why do people still say that they don't want to believe in Jesus? Has God failed? That's the fundamental question. And not only that, another side that John is having in mind here, I think, is not only have the Jews not believing in Jesus, questioning then the perfect plan of God and whether or not God has failed, how about the Greeks? They're coming to believe in Jesus other, um, rather than the Jews. Is this a, a kind of plan B that God kind of revert, giving up on the Jews and then now leaving room for the Greeks to come in? So in verse 37... John, the narrator, feels like he needs to intervene and starts to explain what he had just told us and unfolded for us in 10 chapters of consistency. Where Jesus does miracles, he um, wins arguments, he tells them what he is like, he lives in complete and perfect integrity. And yet, over and over and over again, despite all the evidence that's around the people, despite all the things and all the signs that Jesus had done, over and over and over again, people just refuse to believe in Jesus. And the Gospel of John sharply tells us that the root of unbelief, therefore, is not a lack of evidences. It is not as if people lack evidence. It's not as if people did not witness miraculous things right before them. It's not as if people did not encounter Jesus and discuss things with him. It's not as if Jesus didn't win arguments. He did. It's not because of a lack of evidences that unbelief arises. There's something deeper rooted in the heart that even in the face of evidences, they'll just keep swallowing it up. Not enough evidence, not enough evidence, not enough evidence. So that even in chapter 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus up from the dead, what happens? Let's kill Lazarus. <laughs> that, would, that would really stop people from coming to believe in Jesus. Let's kill Lazarus. We have to quelch the evidence that Jesus really did raise this man up from the dead. This, this, this can't be. People can't believe in him. The more evidences Jesus offers to them, the more they harden their hearts. And by the way, friends, if you read throughout not just the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Matthew as well, this doesn't just happen before the resurrection, right? You would think that before the resurrection, okay, Jesus is a man who could do some miracles and yet still people don't believe in him. But even in, after the resurrection, in the book of Matthew, if you read Matthew chapter 28, right before the Great Commission, Jesus appears to a lot of people after his resurrection. Nail-pierced hands, walking around, eating with them, walking through doors, right? doing more miracles in front of them, telling Thomas, you know, touch me. And yet, in Matthew 28, verse 17, it says very clearly, some still doubt it. And you would think, they've seen Jesus crucified. It's a very public criminal offense. It's a very public criminal uh, punishment. And here's Jesus right before them, nail-pierced hands, eating fish with them even, and some still doubt doubt it. You would think, okay, before the resurrection, I understand why people might still not believe in Jesus, but after the resurrection, surely people will believe in Jesus. Not so. So there's something about unbelief that swallows up evidences, even in the most obvious evidences. We might 
feel and think today, right? If, if Jesus would just show up, if he would just write his name on the sky, tells me that he is true and that he really exists and he would just prove himself out to me, I will bow down and I will worship. Well, we've seen that's not the case. This never been the case in the Old Testament. God opened up the Red Sea and the moment they crossed the Red Sea, this am amazing miracle before the light's eyes, they grumbled against God. God offered down manna from heaven, and the Israelites demanded meat. Over and over again in the Old Testament, God's faithfulness and, and his signs proved to be true again and again, and the people of God continued to spurn him. And why should we then be surprised that this is the case even in the New Testament, in the case even today? If Jesus would suddenly show up, we might think that we will fall to our knees and immediately believe in the gospel, believe in the existence of God and everything he's ever said. Not so. And the disciples were not shy about this truth. The disciples did not open up Jesus' story. and he, They didn't present him as if he was this amazing worker and everything just turned out well for him. Even after the resurrection, people still disbelieved in Jesus Christ. Which then demands us to ask the question that John is wanting to address here in verse 37. If Jesus had done so many signs and if he really is the Jewish Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament, had he failed? All these Jews are disbelieving. They still want to kill him. And in fact, he's about to unfold the greatest sin committed against him. He will be crossed and crucified. And not only that, the Greeks are coming to believe in him. Is this a kind of plan B? What is God trying to say? Who is this Jesus person given so many people disbelieved in him? And if this is really the record of his public ministry. Surely is a failure, right? So John is wanting us to ask that question in verse 37. And, and in addressing that, and in, in concluding Jesus' public ministry, John appeals to two texts from the prophet Isaiah to tell us God's plan is still perfect and God's plan is still unfolding. This is not a surprise to God. And in fact, this is exactly what was planned by God and prophesied by God through the prophet Isaiah. So look at verse 38. It says there, So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And when you see the word so that... It is trying to make an inference from verse 37. What is that inference? Jesus doing signs and people not believing in him is so that, for the purpose of, in other words, the prophet Isaiah's uh, a prophecy might be fulfilled. This was happening so that what Isaiah had said in Isaiah 53 would come true in Jesus' life. And what did he say in Isaiah 53? John quotes verse 1 of that chapter. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And Isaiah 53 is asking that as Isaiah is presenting the Messiah of Israel. And Isaiah, however, in that chapter, if you keep reading, I think it's up here on the screen. Who has believed that he is from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord has been revealed? And in that chapter, all the way from 40 to 66 of Isaiah, the arm of the Lord is the salvation of God, the Messiah of God. Who has believed him? Like what Isaiah says. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Nobody expected him to come. He was despised and rejected by man. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. And he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And so the first citation from Isaiah 53, 1, which I think assumes the rest of that chapter, invoking into the, the readers, here is what the Lord had in mind in Isaiah 53. The Lord's Messiah... The one who would rescue Israel, the one who would rescue God's chosen people, the one who would rescue his people from their sins, bring them into a new creation, will not be a triumphant military hero that would rescue God's people from political tyranny. No. The arm of the Lord's salvation is one who is utterly despised and rejected by men, a root coming out of dry ground. No one would expect him to come in this way, in other words. And nothing about him would naturally attract our attention to him. And he would come in a manner that is a spy so that, as we're going to read later, or, or, or as we, if we read, keep reading in Isaiah 53, so that he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. So John is saying, if people are not believing in Jesus, and you're thinking God has failed, 
John is reminding them, haven't you forgotten? Have you forgotten what Isaiah said? The Messiah is not some political hero that is going to have some great earthly, worldly success. The Messiah would come in a way that nobody would expect. The Messiah would come in a way that is rejected, not esteemed by man, so that what? He would be crushed for our iniquities and pierced for our transgressions. And friends, if he was pierced, if he was crushed, there assumes a piercer and a crusher. If he was rejected, there assumes there will be people who are rejecting him. If he was not esteemed, there would some who were esteeming him not, right? The passive verbs there that refers to Jesus as piercing, Jesus as being crushed, Jesus being rejected, refers to others, his own people, who would reject him, who would esteem him not, who would crush him. So John is saying, why are you surprised? Jesus is the very fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah had said, right? Jesus is the very person that would come so that he would come to his own, as John reminds us of verse 11 of chapter 1 in the very prologue. John tells us, he would come to his own and his own did not receive him. So don't look for a political hero. Look for a suffering servant. Look for a suffering Messiah. And verse 39 unfolds that even further. Therefore, what should we conclude from this? If Jesus really is a suffering servant who be pierced for our transgressions, when we would esteem him not as Isaiah 53 has told us, what are the consequences of that? What's the logical deduction we have from that? He says in verse 39, Therefore, they could not believe. And there's no getting around those words. They do not have the power to believe. They do not have the ability to believe. In other words, the reason why they could not believe was so that the prophet Isaiah's words might be fulfilled. There is an inability on their part because it was part of the plan of God that there would be some who would reject Christ. And it was precisely through their rejection that the Messiah would be esteemed, not that the Messiah would be crushed for the iniquities of the world. And for this to be fulfilled, there had to be unbelief. They could not believe. And Isaiah probes into this a bit further. Not merely is going to quote from Isaiah 53, 1, right? John is going to quote from Isaiah 6, 9 to 10, something that we read in our confession of sin. What did Isaiah say there? And John quotes this. He says, for again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So when Isaiah was called in chapter 6, he seen the holiness of God and he saw his own sinfulness. He saw that he was a man of unclean lips. He saw that gap between himself and God. He says, here I am. Send me out to the world. Send me out to the nations. Send me out to Israel. Let me proclaim your word. And what is that word? What is the purpose of that word of God? Go out to them so that in your preaching, and this is not easy for us to understand or for us to hear, God will have blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So in Isaiah's preaching and the Israelites' rejection of Isaiah's preaching, God is not surprised. In fact, it was actually purposed as a judgment on Israel, saying the people's hearts are hardened and go preach to them. And in your preaching, I will give the Israelites hearts over through their own hardness. God, in other words, is never surprised by unbelief. In fact, it was the very part of his plan that Jesus would come to preach. And just as Isaiah was sent to preach to the Israelites in Isaiah 6 so that they might be further hardened, God is saying here, he has sent Jesus to his own in part for judgment in part so that their eyes might be hardened. In part, however, above all, so that through their unbelief, he would be pierced for their transgressions. In other words, God has so ordained things to come to pass that evil was intended by God, not so that there will be more evil, but evil would be so ordained such that evil produces the very opposite of its consequences. Evil would produce, would, would, would produce the very opposite of his original intention by the men. Evil ends, ends up, in other words, producing the highest good. Through the unbelief of God's people, through the unbelief of those ordained by God, 
Jesus would become the crucified Messiah through whom those sins themselves are redeemed. That's the beauty and the sovereignty of God. And that's what John is wanting to communicate to us. So don't be surprised when the people of God are not believing in Christ. And this might be, again, hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to grapple with this, right? So if, if in this chapter, verses 37 to 42 or 41, we're peering a little bit into the, a glimpse of the decrees of God, God's plan and God's ordination, God's ordinances and God's decree, that this would be what happens, that this is the prophesied Messiah, that this is the kind of death that he would die, that he would be rejected, that this unbelief is not outside of his plan. This is talking about the primary cause, God's ordination of the unbelief. All right. In verses 42, 43, which brings us to our second point, talks about the human side of unbelief. And the human side of unbelief, therefore, is not negated by God as a primary cause. We're often tempted to think that if God is the primary cause of all things, if God really does control everything that comes to pass, if God really does predestine all things that come to pass, including unbelief, we often think, well, therefore, we have no responsibility. Therefore, we're just robots. God is in control of everything. We are not in control of anything whatsoever. And in fact, that's what Paul encounters in Romans chapter 9. You will say, then, why does God find fault? If God really does bring all things to come to pass, if the unbelief of these people is not outside the plan of God, then what role do we have? We're not responsible for our sins. But John doesn't allow us to go there. In fact, right after John just simply proclaims this truth, he doesn't explain it, he just says it. That is so that the prophet Isaiah's prophecies would be fulfilled, he goes straight to human responsibility in verses 42 to 43. As if he's just presenting this to us. Look, God is in control. We're responsible. I'm not going to tell us how this works. I'm not going to tell us how this mystery is explained. But simply, we need to affirm both of these truths. And our human reasoning and our feeble understandings is going to be tempted to say, well, if we're completely responsible, then God is not in control. We make a logical deduction, and it seems super clear. We're responsible for our sins. Well, God is not in control of us. God is taken by surprise. God responds. God reacts. God doesn't want us to sin, so God is not in control. So one truth is used to negate the other. Whereas on the other side, we might be tempted to say, God is in control, so we're not responsible. And by feeble human deductions, we might say that that makes sense in our heads, but the Bible doesn't let us confess that. Just as in the Trinity, we say God is one and fully three. We might be tempted to say God is one and therefore not three. Or we might be tempted to say God is three and therefore not really one, that we worship three gods, and that's a heresy. You see, at the root of our Christian faith is a mystery. And in our ordinary ways of thinking, we're going to be tempted to deny one pole of the mystery for the affirmation of the other. But the Bible doesn't let us go there. The Bible merely represents both of these truths and tells us at the bottom of these things is a mystery. So don't try to comprehend it simply confess it simply confess it you're responsible god is in control don't let one truth deny the other before i unfold um the further truths of the second point uh, we're going to talk about christian love maybe an analogy would help and it's helped me uh, to understand this and i used this in yesterday's membership class so for those of you who came to yesterday's membership class i apologize beforehand you see that temptation to negate one side of the truth for the other, to say that if we're responsible and God is not in control, kind of pictures God the way the Greeks pictured Zeus. Zeus in the Greek mythologies of um, Homer and so on, Zeus is kind of like in the heavenly courts and Zeus looks down. He's not really involved in the affairs of the human world and Zeus looks down and sometimes when he approves of things, he comes down and he rewards some people. And sometimes when he disapproves of things, he comes down and then he intervenes and he punishes some people, right? So Zeus is kind of a passive onlooker, looks around the affairs of the world, but kind of is in the same plane of existence with the world such that sometimes he comes down and intervenes such that when he intervenes, the, the creature's responsibility is kind of stopped. When Zeus comes in and intervenes on the history of the world, creaturely responsibility is put to a halt, and then they all behold Zeus, and then, you know, he, he disappears again, all right? So we just have to picture God in that way. God is kind of in the heavenly place, and then looks down. He's not really in control of anything, 
right? He's, he's in the same plane of existence. God is within time, and sometimes he intervenes. Sometimes he punishes, sometimes he blesses. But that's not the way the Bible relates our relationship with God. See, we don't relate with God in the way that we on the first floor relate with the God on the third floor, or even Zeus in the heavenly courts up there in the space, in, in the, the limits of time and space. We don't relate with God the way the Greeks related with Zeus. We don't relate with God with the way we do with human tyrants, where when human tyrants control us, it coerces us. You see, we relate with God instead in the way the characters of Romeo and Juliet relate with Shakespeare. God and us exist in a fundamentally two different ways. God exists in not merely a higher form of existence, not merely in a higher form of degree. God exists in a plane of existence completely different than other than us. And so, therefore, his being and his existence doesn't violate us. He can control and ordain and author all things that come to pass without violating the real and contingent features of the story of history. So if we ask the question, why did Romeo kill himself at the end of Romeo and Juliet? In the level of the storyline, we might say Romeo killed himself because he thought that Juliet died. He thought that he had embarrassed his family. He thought that he, this was this all for nothing, that my love of Juliet is, is, is now for nothing, which, by the way, is simply idolatry of Juliet. And that's why he committed suicide, and that's where the tragedy ended in that way. And that's the level of what the Westminster Confession of Faith calls a secondary cause. These are real secondary causes. That within the level of the storyline, there are real causes that led to Romeo's suicide. But in the level of the primary cause, we can also say that Shakespeare was the author of the play. And notice, the, the author of the play, with respect to the relationship to the play, there is no past, present, and future with respect to the author. Shakespeare can pick up that book and enter that book whenever he wants. The book is self-contained, and Shakespeare is in a completely different realm of reality. God exists in exactly that way. He's in a complete dimension, different from us altogether. He's in a different plane of existence. He's in a different plane of being. And so God can control whatever that comes to pass in a way that is still utterly mysterious to us, but still at the same time doesn't negate the real secondary causes that leads to our belief or unbelief. We might say, for example, that we were converted because a friend told us one day about the gospel, because of a great tragic moment in our lives that made us realize how much we needed God, because of that one moment where you open up the Bible and suddenly you were reading passages and they were, they, were, they, were, they were alive to you, or because of your parents and you grew up in a godly home. These are real secondary causes in your life. But who's the primary author? God. And so in the same way Isaiah is saying from verse 37 to 41, the primary author of these things is the unbelief of the people, it's up to God so that Jesus will become crucified. But in 42 to 43, he leads us to the secondary causes. The real causes that leave us responsible, the real causes that resides in our hearts that leads to the unbelief, and also actually explains true Christian belief, true Christian love. And look at what he says there in 42. He says, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So we might have expected in verse 37 to 41 that John would say, well, look, everybody's sin is excused because it was all part of the plan of God. But he doesn't go there. He doesn't let us go there. Instead, he simply states in verse 42 for fear of the authorities, the Pharisees, or the free, fear of the authority of the Pharisees, people did not intervene. And 43 is a more encompassing explanation for they did not believe, this is an explanation for their unbelief, they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So even though their unbelief was not outside of the plan of God, there was still a secondary cause. And what is that secondary cause? Well, verse 43 tells us. They loved human approval. They loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And this, of course, explains verse 37 a little bit more. The root of unbelief is not about an intellectual lack of evidence. 
The root of unbelief is a matter of love. And what you love most determines how you think and determines how you see the evidences around you. And if that's the root of unbelief, it also tells us then the root of Christian belief. The Christian faith is not one that is mere traditionalism. You do not become a Christian by simply following a set of rules that you grew up with. Or following a set of cultural norms that you grew up with. You do not become a Christian because you are smarter or more reasonable than anyone else because you are able to deduce the facts about God's existence and Jesus' redemption from your own reasoning from the evidences before you. Neither are you a Christian, therefore, because you are any better than anyone else. The fundamental mark of being a Christian, the fundamental mark of what it is to have Christian faith is this, that you love the glory that comes from God more than the glory that comes from man. The Christian faith is rooted in a heart direction of love toward God and a, committed towards, a commitment towards Him that outweighs your commitment towards anything else. That's the root of the Christian faith. So friends, how do we get that kind of faith? How do we get that kind of faith? Do we want to know God? Do we actually want to love Him at all? In fact, I fear that if we don't miss that this is the heart of the Christian faith that is rooted in the Christian love, that it is a kind of faith that sets God apart as the treasure of our hearts, we need to ask ourselves the question, is God truly my treasure? We might have come today this morning and we might have thought to ourselves, right? I fear hell. And that's why I've come to church. I really fear hell. Or some of you might have come this morning and you might be thinking to yourself, I want eternal life. I want immortality, right? And this is precisely what Jesus offers. And you might read John 12, 50 coming up. And when Jesus says, or sorry, when John explains what Jesus says, look at what he says in John 12, 50. I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has said to me. Jesus' words says eternal life. And maybe you're coming this morning and you're saying, that's what I want. I want eternal life. I want immortality. I don't want death. I don't want punishment. I don't want condemnation. I don't want, def- I don't want hell. I fear hell. But if this text is right and the root of Christian love The root of Christian faith is that you treasure God above all else. We need to ask ourselves the hard question, right? Friends, do you come to church, do you come to God simply because you fear hell and want immortality? Or do you want to come to God because he is your treasure? You see, you don't need to be a Christian to fear death. That's your most basic natural instinct. You fear death. You fear punishment. You fear pain. You don't need to be a Christian to want immortality. In fact, some of us might be content to say, if heaven was a real place and I could attain immortality, and if I could live in heaven forever, and I really have everything that the Bible says that heaven has, which is a lack of tears, a lack of disease, a lack of death, a lack of suffering, eternal happiness. You might even picture that kind of heaven as a place that you want to go to even if God was not there. And you might have come to church this morning and say, well, this stuff about eternal life, this stuff about about, about God, I want that. Friends, that's not what gets you in. That is not the mark of true Christian love. That is not the mark of true Christian faith. That is not the mark of true Christianity. You don't have to be Christian to want that. And in fact, if you're not a Christian you might wish that God wasn't there because you don't want a relationship with God. You want all the other benefits that come with it. You want the love. You want the happiness. You want the lack of death. You want the lack of suffering. And in fact, John connects this for us, right? John 17 verse 3 connects John 43 and John 12.50. So in John 12.43, he says that fundamentally, unbelief comes from a love of man rather than love of God, and therefore belief comes from true love of God rather than true love of man. And then 1250 talks about eternal life. Well, John 17, 3 connects these two things together. Love of God and eternal life go together. Look at what Jesus says in John 17, 3. It should be on the screen. 
this eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Helpfully, Jesus defines eternal life for us. Eternal life, therefore, fundamentally at root, is union and being known and knowing God. Union with God himself. Being so enraptured by the love of God that God is the one that you want. Such that when you look at heaven, when you think about heaven, when you, when you set your eyes on the new creation, you don't see fundamentally a lack of punishment. You don't see fundamentally a lack of pain. You don't see fundamentally a lack of sorrow. You see fundamentally the reason behind those things. And that reason is that you are now with God. You know Him. And this, this knowledge of God is not a mere intellectual head knowledge. This knowledge of God is a full embodied resurrection knowledge of God in the same way you might know your spouse because a Christian marriage is a pointer to our union with God. It is a full embodied knowledge. You love Him and you know Him fully and He knows you and loves you fully. This is what heaven is to you and this is what makes heaven look attractive to you. Do you love this more than anything the world can offer? Such that you might say, even if God was there and the world disappears entirely, all the other benefits of God disappear entirely, you will say, that is enough. Is God your treasure? Is that what you want? Is that what we want? God is enough. So if the root of, of unbelief is you love the world and you even envision eternity as, as basically the, word, or the world without suffering and without God, friends, you're not a Christian. The true mark of the Christian faith is that you will love the world, sorry, you will love God more than anything else in the world, more than anything else the world could offer you. You love the glory that comes from God more than anything else. Eternal life is knowing God. And this brings us to the final point, which is about God's just judgment and more about eternity. God's just judgment. Friends, if that is the root of the Christian faith, is the love of God, and the root of the Christian faith is saying, yes, that God is my treasure, and you could take the world and you could give me Jesus, that the, 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 the false opinions and the empty promises and the empty praises of man mean nothing to me. And the riches of the world mean nothing to me. And I want to love God and I want to be with God. I want to be known by God. I want to be with God forever, right? If that is who God is to you and that God is truly your treasure, well, you're faced with a conundrum. Because despite your love of God, you will now come to the realization and with Isaiah, ask yourself, how can I, a man of unclean lips, approach a holy and loving and righteous God? Look at what Jesus says in verse 46. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus is saying that apart from Christ, anyone apart from Christ is someone who is already in darkness. Such that when you disbelieve in Christ, it is not that you enter into darkness, it's not that you become condemned, rather you are already condemned. And in fact, that's what Jesus says in John 5, 27 to 29, and if you look at John 3, 18 to 22, the Apostle John says the same thing. Those who do not believe in Jesus are condemned already. Condemnation does not come by disbelieving in Jesus. Condemnation comes because of our sin. And the Christian suddenly feels the weight of his sin and if you're feeling this today, the Spirit is at work within you. You don't come to God and you don't ask God, why would you judge me when my sins are so small and few? You see, secular irreligion are prone to say this. Well, if God really does exist, if God really is the good and holy and righteous God that he is, the really all-loving God that he is, then why would he judge the little sins that I have? Because relatively speaking, I'm pretty good. So secular religion says that basically human beings are good and we deserve eternity. We deserve goodness. We're entitled to it. And in fact, we get angry when we don't get it, right? Secular religion says that we're basically good. Man-made religion, on the other hand, also says that you come into the world not already in darkness, but you come into the world in a kind of neutral state. Man-made religion says you come into the world in a neutral state. You could go either left or right. You could go into the light or darkness. You just try your best. 
And then who knows what will happen? Maybe you'll end up in darkness. Maybe you'll end up in the light. So just try your best. You don't know where you're going to go. You're kind of in a neutral position. Just try your best. Sometimes you end up in the light. Sometimes you end up in the dark. But it really just depends on you and God will judge you. And maybe God will be forgiving. You see, both secular religion and, and man-made religion is completely contrary to what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, friends, you're not good. And you didn't come into this world in innocence, in a kind of neutral space between left and right. You came to the world defiled and utterly destitute of light. You came to the world totally depraved. We came to the world totally in darkness. Such that when you come before God, you do not dare ask God, how could you, a holy and righteous God, judge the little sins that I have? We come before God and we feel, God, how can you, a holy and righteous God, accept a ruined, miserable wretch like me? We may have come this morning and we're used to this kind of language. I'm going to come this Sunday and I'll see if this religion thing makes sense. I'll see if I'll invite God into my heart. I'll see if God makes sense to me. I'll see if I'll make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'll see if I'll invite him into my life. As if it's up to us. As if it is God who is in the dark. As if it is God who is in judgment. As if it is we who get to decide whether or not God plays a role, a supporting role in us who are the main character. No. You don't get to decide whether God is in your life or not. He already is. And he's your judge. We don't get to decide whether God enters into our life or not. He already is. And friends, he sees you. And you know your own thoughts. We know our own hearts. There is serious darkness and misery there. And you might want to try to suppress your conscience. You might want to say, my guilt is really not that great. How can God really judge me? And you might start to compare yourself with other people. But friends, you know your own hearts. Stop suppressing the truth. Jesus has come not for judgment. But judgment is inevitable if you reject the only remedy for your destitute state. And now, if you love God, why should God accept you? How it is, can you be satisfied with your true love? How it is, can you now be reunited with God again? Well, friends, fix your eyes on the one point in all of human history where you see Christian love, the very love of God poured out to us and the very proof that God loves us and the very proof of why we should love God even more. Not merely that he created us, and the very place where that love of God and our love for God converges with God's plan and perfection and predestining decree. And that singular point is as Isaiah said in chapter 53. And as John is communicating here, God's plan and God's judgment and God's love converge at the cross of Jesus Christ. Our unbelief is no surprise to God, but God has used that very unbelief to place His Son as a ransom, as a sacrifice, as your substitute, so that that very unbelief will not have been paid for by His Son. You see, God didn't merely have all of this in His plan without entering into it. God didn't merely have darkness not surprise Him. God Himself planned to have entered that darkness that you were in, such that it is now Jesus who experiences that death. And that when you encounter death, when you encounter punishment, when you encounter your own guilt, Jesus can say, I was there. This is not a surprise to me. And now we can look at the cross. We can look at the suffering servant. We can look at how God has made all of the unbelief and all of the evil concentrated on a single point and made it into the highest good. And God didn't merely, therefore, tell you that he is your highest good and that he is your love. But he has proven it to you. That while we were still sinners, while we were still in destiny, while we were still guilty before God, enemies of God, our conscience is condemning us, our sins were ever before us, we can look at the cross and say, God, you've proven your love for me, and now I can love you. I can approach you. I'm clean. He has taken away my sins. I'm no longer a man of unclean lips. I can, uh, I can approach a man 
Jesus Christ, who is God himself, God incarnate, God in the flesh, he is mine and I am his forever. He's my treasure. And if I have this, I have my peace. I have my righteousness. What else do I want? Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. He is my vision. He's my wisdom. He dwells within me. The greatest sins are transformed into our highest good and our highest glory. So friends, come to Jesus. If you're not believing in him yet, come to Jesus now. Have faith in him. He offers his life to you and come to him and you would have been proven to have been chosen by God. Let's pray. Father, we come and stand amazed. Desperate, ruined, miserable sinners that we are. We come naked, clinging, Lord God, not to anything in ourselves, not to anything we've ever done, anything in our own minds or hearts. But Father, we come clinging to the cross, naked, shameful, so that we want to be clothed and unashamed, clothed in your righteousness and indwelled by your Holy Spirit, the cleansing, washing Spirit of God. Wash us now, Lord God. Help us now have faith in you. Help us see, Lord God, that in the cross we can come before our holy God and have our love satisfied. You are my treasure. Be thou my vision. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.